Can we trust the New Testament as a reliable document? Many skeptics say no, and that it is based on dated copies and filled with errors. But what does the evidence say? Christians for centuries have pointed to the evidence that we can trust the New Testament as reliable to what it originally said. So what evidence can we offer? Well, when it comes to an ancient document, the more manuscripts we have, the better. That way there is more to cross-check for accuracy and identify changes that may have happened through the process known as textual criticism. So we would obviously want more to compare with so we can get back to the original. So what do we have of the New Testament? Of the original language of the New Testament, we have over 5,800 Greek manuscripts. In Latin, we have over 10,000 manuscripts. In various other languages, we have between 5,000 and 10,000 manuscripts. So we have an extremely wide variety of New Testament manuscripts from across the ancient world we can study and compare. And with more manuscripts, the more accurate we will be at reconstructing the original through textual criticism. But even if we didn't have any manuscripts, we would still have the entire New Testament preserved in the writings of the Church Fathers. It is estimated there are over 1 million New Testament quotes in the Church Fathers alone. If there was a large amount of intentional or accidental corruption of the text, then it would be easy to trace by comparing manuscripts of different regions. There was never a time when any one man or group of men had control over the text of the New Testament. There was never a Christian Uthman. All assertions regarding adding doctrines, changing theology, removing teachings, etc. are without merit. The Christian church was a persecuted minority without power to enforce a uniform textual transmission, as in Islam. This is far more than any other ancient document. The second most widely attested would be Homer's Iliad, with only 1,757 copies, and then Suetonius with around 200 copies. So if one is still skeptical of the New Testament after knowing of how widely attested it is, then they should be even more skeptical of other ancient works. As scholar Dan Wallace says, They have never thought about this other ancient literature and reflecting on what that would be like. If I'm going to be skeptical about the New Testament and I apply that skepticism to other ancient Greco-Roman literature, guess what? We immediately go back into the Dark Ages. We've eclipsed all knowledge in the last 500 years. But not only do we have a large amount of manuscripts, but we have very early complete manuscripts and even earlier fragments. The oldest complete New Testament is within 300 years of the original, the closest of any ancient document. But we have even earlier witnesses and fragments, like this one, P52 from between 90 AD to 125 AD, and others like these, from approximately 170 AD to 220 AD. We also have a larger fragment from around this time in P75, which has 102 survived pages from Luke and John. Comparing this to other ancient documents, the earliest copy of the Iliad is far off with 500 years from its original, and Suetonius is 800 years from its original. As you can see, the New Testament is by far the closest to its original than any other ancient document. So if we are to be skeptical of the New Testament, then we should be even more skeptical of other ancient literature. In fact, we have about a dozen fragmented manuscripts dating to around the 2nd century, which represent about 40% of the entire New Testament and we have 120 manuscripts around 300 years from the original, which is incredible compared to other ancient documents. But despite this, some scholars still argue the New Testament copies are too late and full of errors. The leading critic Bart Ehrman says, Not only do we not have the originals, we don't have the first copies of the originals. We don't even have copies of the copies of the original, or copies of copies of copies of the originals. What we have are copies made later, much later, and these copies all differ from one another in many thousands of places. Well, this seems like an odd thing to say, given the evidence we just discussed. So let's divide his objection into two parts and deal with each appropriately. The first is that our earliest manuscripts are extremely far off from the originals, not even copies of copies of copies of the originals. Well, this doesn't make sense, considering our earliest fragment is within 70 years or less of the original, and several larger fragments are around 150 years from the original. So why would these not be first or second generation copies of the originals? A papyrus manuscript in public use will last on average for more than 100 years. There is also no reason to assume the originals or first generation copies were copied once and thrown away or lost. In fact, Ehrman even acknowledges that a manuscript can likely be a direct copy of one from 100 years prior to it. Every time somebody translates the Bible, they don't say, well, I've got to take this manuscript that I translated from and destroy that now. That's stupid. We don't do that. It's never been done in the history of the church. There is no reason to assume the originals were just copied once and forgotten, or that scribes only had one copy to pull from. In fact, early church father Tertullian even seems to suggest the originals 
were still around when he was writing at the end of the second century. Come now, you who would indulge a better curiosity, if you would apply it to the business of your salvation, run over to the apostolic churches, in which the very thrones of the apostles are still preeminent, in their places, in which their own authentic writings are read. The Latin word for authentic normally refers to original documents, so it appears Tertullian is saying the originals were still in the churches to that day. He specifically refers to the letters of Corinthians, Philippians, Thessalonians, Ephesians, and Romans, and urges readers to visit these places to see the authentic writings for themselves. Even if Tertullian didn't mean the original scrolls the apostles wrote on, his testimony still tells us the Christians in his days were concerned with having accurate writings and they were not discarding their copies as valueless, as skeptics suggest. And it's reasonable to suggest that if the manuscripts were read often, they were also copied often. And in fact, the amount of manuscripts we have today obviously suggests that. Ehrman's reasoning seems to imply New Testament copying was like a game of telephone, where a 4th century copy is a copy from one from a 3rd century, which in turn is a copy of one from the 2nd century, which is a copy of one from the 1st century, which was a copy of the original. But there is no reason to suggest the originals or the first copies were simply lost after they were copied once. Scraps could always go back to the earliest copies of their day that had survived and simply copy that. St. Arrhenius even testifies he had access to some of the earliest copies of the Book of Revelations, suggesting early copies were being preserved for accuracy and transmission. And the testimony of early church fathers indicates how sacred they considered these documents, so they were not carelessly being copied, but being held in high regard to preserve the faith passed down from the apostles. In fact, scholars Daryl Bach and Dan Wallace note the earliest manuscripts we have probably go back to around 100 AD. Two of the oldest manuscripts we have, Papyrus 75 or P75 and Codex Vaticanus or B, have an exceptionally strong agreement, and they are among the most accurate manuscripts that exist today. P75 is about 125 years older than B, yet it is not an ancestor of B. Instead, B was copied from an earlier manuscript of P75. See the detailed work of C.L. Porter. The combination of these two manuscripts in a particular reading must surely go back to the very beginning of the second century. So the idea that our copies are far too late doesn't stand up to evidence, and textual criticism demonstrates we are not too far off from the originals. So what about Ehrman's other claim, that all other manuscripts have much variation and differ from one another in thousands of places? Ehrman and other skeptics will usually throw out the fact that there are 400,000 variants across New Testament manuscripts, which is in fact true. However, when you look at the details, this isn't a big deal. For example, the reason we have so many variants is because we have so many manuscripts. That would be expected with such a high number of manuscripts. But even with that, remember we have close to 6,000 New Testament Greek manuscripts, which comes to about 2.6 million pages of New Testament. If you do the math, that is one variant per six and a half pages. Not really that much. Second, what kinds of variants are there? Well, 75% of them are simply spelling errors, which do not affect the meaning of the text. 15% are variation in Greek synonyms and transpositions, which cannot even be translated. About 9% do affect the meaning of the text, but they are from very late documents, and obviously resolved by looking at earlier manuscripts. Then, less than 1% do actually affect the meaning of the text, and are from early manuscripts. But none of these variants actually challenge or affect essential Christian doctrines, as Bart Ehrman even admits, the position I argue for in misquoting Jesus does not actually stand at odds with Professor Metzger's position that the essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. This is the guy on whose works Muslims and atheists are basing their wild claims that the Orthodox have so corrupted the text that it must not have been Orthodox at all originally. They don't know what they're talking about, but they're basing it on Dr. Ehrman's work he does know what he's talking about. I happen to disagree with him about a number of things, but I don't disagree with him over this. In fact, in our three debates, at the end of each debate, I say, by the way, I think you agree with me, Bart, that essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants. And I put this screen up. He's never disputed it. He, he said it. It's in print. He can't deny himself. There's absolutely no evidence to suggest Christian doctrines are affected by variants in the manuscripts and there is next to zero evidence to suggest we cannot get back to the originals. In fact, given all the evidence, there are only 40 lines of the New Testament unresolved by textual criticism, giving it an accuracy of 99.5%, which by far is the best of any ancient document. 
Now obviously, there is still debate over what a handful of passages were originally, and no Christian scholar argues we've exactly word for word what the original authors wrote. But in light of this evidence, we should also avoid radical skepticism that we can certainly never know anything of what the original authors wrote. It simply doesn't stand up to evidence. The overwhelming amount of scriptural passages aren't even debated, and there is no textual evidence that threatens the origins of essential Christian doctrines. So is the New Testament reliable? The obvious answer is yes, and we have barely scratched the surface of evidence. The onus is on the skeptic. The New Testament sets the standard in providing clear evidence of its trustworthiness. If that is not enough, is it possible the skeptic has set a standard that is unreasonable? And if so, why? The basic point to remember is if anyone wants to argue the New Testament has been drastically changed, that requires evidence. Paranoid suspicion doesn't cut it. New Testament documents were spread all over the ancient world, and we have recovered several manuscripts from the 2nd and 3rd century in various regions during times of great persecution and no political power. There was never any central control over the New Testament, and no ability to produce drastic changes. Manuscripts lost to that time period have been rediscovered today, and they would have revealed doctrinal changes in the current text we have, but none of them actually show this. What history demonstrates is as James White says, there were multiple lines of transmission coming out of the first century, all confirming the same message. And they has preserved it through the entire manuscript tradition so that there's never a controlling authority that can change or edit the text, put in doctrines, take out doctrines, etc., etc. The result of that is we have to look at textual variants. But the fact is, that is the best way to preserve the text, especially given the evangelical mandate of the early church. So the idea that, well, you know, uh, if, if there was these primitive uh, corruptions before the manuscript tradition is found in history, therefore we can never know what the originals were. When you have multiple lines, how do all those multiple lines end up having the same readings in them? Not identical readings, but it's still the same New Testament. It's still teaching the same thing. The burden is on the skeptic. The Christian can stand on what historical evidence has revealed. But what about the variants that we do have? Well, as discussed, the vast majority do not affect the meaning of the text and cannot even be translated. The many that do affect the meaning of the text are from late manuscripts and resolved by textual criticism. There are only a few, less than 1% of all variants, that do affect the meaning of the text and are from early manuscripts. Dan Wallace estimates there are about a thousand total. But even most of these are not even a real major issue. For example, one unresolved textual variant is 1 Thessalonians 2.7, where Paul says we either became gentle or little children among you. The difference in Greek between the two is one letter, and both could fit with the context. Another is Romans 5.1, where Paul either says, let us have peace with God, or we have peace with God. Again, the difference is one letter, and both make sense with the context. But do either of these variants really affect Christian theology, regardless of which one is right? Of course not. So no variant is affecting theology. It is affecting our understanding of select passages, as Dan Wallace says. The question that we're asking is not which one fits into Pauline theology, but which one fits into that passage. And so the value of knowing about these textual variants is how they affect our exegesis in our exposition, not how they affect our theology. Moreover, the followers of Jesus were Aramaic-speaking peasants from Galilee, lower-class men who were not educated. In fact, Peter and, uh, and John in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, are literally said to be illiterate. They couldn't read and write. Of course not. They were fishermen. They didn't go to school. The vast majority of people in the ancient world never learned to read, let alone write. And their native language was Aramaic. These books are written in Greek by highly educated, rhetorically trained writers who are skilled in Greek composition. So Ehrman claims the New Testament writers were all poor Aramaic-speaking fishermen from Galilee, and they could not have written the New Testament because they were illiterate. Well, first off, the early church did not claim the New Testament was written by only illiterate fishermen, and neither do Christian scholars today. The external evidence indicates it was Matthew who wrote a gospel, who was a tax collector, and would have to have been trained in linguistics to keep track of records in Greek for Rome, as well as understand the local language of Aramaic to speak with the taxpayers to do his work. So he would not have been illiterate. Mark was said to be the Greek scribe and interpreter for Peter, 
so he would also have to understand how to read and write in both languages. Luke was said to be a physician, so he was also educated. No one doubts that Paul was educated as a Pharisaic Jew who studied under Gamaliel. That leaves us Peter, James, Jude, and John, all who could have learned to write later on once they took leadership roles in the church. But let's just throw all that out and agree with Ehrman that yes, they were all illiterate fishermen. The best way to respond to this quote from a scholar is with a quote from another scholar. So to respond to Ehrman, we'll pick uh, Dr. Ehrman. Aren't there some theories that suggest that maybe Paul himself uh, had scribes that wrote for him? Well, it, every, every person who wrote epistles in the ancient world dictated them to scribes. Right. So as Dr. Ehrman rightly points out for Dr. Ehrman, everyone dictated the scribes in the ancient world. So it doesn't matter if all the New Testament authors were illiterate. They could simply hire scribes to write for them. And since just about every scholar agrees that the early church grew by attracting many Gentile converts across the empire, it is quite easy to see they could have received help in writing from possible new converts. Or at the very least, the Gentile members could have helped in funding to hire scribes to write the epistles and gospels. And we know from Paul, the Christian missionaries sought financial help from the new Gentile converts to continue the work of spreading the gospel. So it is not hard to see how the Christians were able to write the New Testament by hiring scribes, with the financial help of their growing church. And Dr. Ehrman should know not to use arguments and debates against Christians that he knows are untenable when he debates Christ mythers. One should not change their argument based on who they are talking to. Before the New Testament was written down, it was transmitted and preserved through an oral tradition. We've already explained in this series the transmission of the New Testament through manuscripts is reliable, but what about the oral transmission before it was written down? The moment skeptics hear this, they immediately assume it is unreliable and go right to the analogy of the telephone game. How can the New Testament be reliable if it was preserved through word of mouth? Wouldn't doctrinal changes be easy to insert? The problem is this is really one giant attempt to judge another completely different culture with our own Western cultural views. People in the modern West have a hard time understanding how ancient people could retain large amounts of detailed teachings since we live in a culture that is flooded with written information and several ways to record and reference things. Ancient people didn't have this technology and instead used various techniques to train their memories to retain vast amounts of detailed information. Using these techniques today, combined with hard work and dedication, can yield the same strong memory skills. The Talmud describes an ideal student should be as a well-plastered cistern, which would not let even a single drop escape. Ancient Jews were capable of memorizing large amounts of scripture, and ancient Greek storytellers were able to memorize the entire Iliad or Odyssey. The other point is the transmission of important stories and teachings through oral tradition doesn't compare at all to the modern version of the telephone game. The point of the telephone game is to skew the message for a good laugh. It is transmitted secretly from one ear to the next, and there is no chance to hear the message repeatedly before it is passed on. This is not a good representation of how the transmission of important teachings were preserved through oral tradition. Ancient cultures transmitted oral teachings and sacred beliefs in the open for the whole tribe or community to hear, and it was repeated many times for all those present to memorize. If someone would skew the message during reciting, the whole community would be present to correct errors. If you go back 2,000 years, oral tradition was the way that sacred beliefs, personal family information, tribal and national patriotic traditions were passed along. Education was almost entirely by rote memorization. It was not unusual for Greek school children to have Homer's Iliad or Odyssey or large portions of it committed to memory, or for young Jewish boys to have large parts of the Hebrew scriptures, what Christians call the Old Testament, committed to memory. Most of all, it is important to look at what scholars actually say regarding oral tradition. Do academic scholars and historians who have studied oral tradition in various cultures treat it like the telephone game? Hardly. In fact, they say many in the West have overlooked the value in preservation that can be found in oral transmission among various cultures. Tony Lentz says, Western academic measurement of success by literacy and printed research colored the expectation of classical scholars as they considered writing in ancient culture. Writing was so important to their world that they assumed it was key to the growth of ancient culture. Johann Draper says, 
Embedded oral forms and traditions allow people to remember astonishing amounts of material, while at the same time ensuring that the material is to some extent fluid and adaptable. For instance, the praise poems of the Zulu kings, collected by Trevor Cope, show both stability and partial verbatim agreement from one performance to another, but also considerable variety in the ordering and choice of possible components to suit the occasion. Kenneth Bailey worked for years in the Middle East and speaks of people retaining large amounts to memory and accurately preserving historical data orally for several years. We are here observing a community that can create over the centuries and sustain in current usage up to 6,000 wisdom sayings. Notice he said the community preserved the sayings. It was not dependent on one man, but on a collective group working together to preserve the tradition. Scholars note ancient people put a strong emphasis on memorization and developed several techniques for training one's memory. David Carr notes in Mesopotamia, more advanced students appear to have learned through a process of dictation and recitation. Students not only had to memorize individual elements of standard works, but also had to be able to place the text they had memorized in the correct order. This is very similar to how modern actors are able to memorize large amounts of lines and monologues to recite on stage. Ancient teachers would often repeat their teachings over and over and have their students repeat it back to them so they would commit it to memory. People from the ancient world up to the medieval world put such a strong emphasis on memory that Mary Carruthers says, a person without memory, if such a thing could be, would be a person without moral character and in the basic sense, without humanity. And this was no exception in ancient Judea. David Carr notes Josephus recorded Jews could recite their laws easier than their own names. It was not uncommon for a Jew to have the entire Old Testament memorized by age 14. They took the book of Proverbs seriously when it said to write the law on the tablet of their heart. This was a culture that Jesus and the apostles were born and raised in. Memorization of large amounts of teachings in scripture was the standard. So there is no reason to assume the disciples of Jesus could not retain and memorize large amounts of his teachings. Such a duty would have been expected in becoming a disciple of a rabbi. With that being said, we must recognize there are two forms of oral tradition, controlled and uncontrolled. A controlled oral tradition means that the material is memorized and identified as a preserved tradition. It is not meant to change, but be preserved. Whereas an uncontrolled oral tradition is a living tradition, which is subject to variations as the community or tribe needs. There is no set teacher and no control within which the material is passed from one person to another and is open to additions. So the question becomes, what was the New Testament? A controlled or uncontrolled tradition. The obvious solution is to look at the surviving texts of the earliest Christians and see how they viewed the words of Jesus and see if we can find structures for memory enhancement. If memory enhancing structures exist in the text, we have a clear indication the text was meant to be memorized and preserved, not changed throughout time. There is in fact plenty of evidence in the New Testament which indicates a controlled tradition. First, we already indicated the culture they were raised in put a strong emphasis on memorization and preserving tradition. But also, Jesus taught in much the same way Jewish rabbis of his day taught, a pupil-teacher relationship with his disciples. He spent time instructing them and expected them to obey and imitate him. Samuel Breiskog notes, Jesus expected his disciples to use him as a model. More importantly, the disciples and early Christians considered Jesus God's divine agent. His words would have been considered sacred. As Harold Reisenfeld said, the words and deeds of Jesus are a holy word comparable with that of the Old Testament, and the handing down of this precious material is entrusted to special persons. On top of that, we find several techniques in the New Testament for enhancing memorization. First, Jesus taught lessons through stories and visuals. He is constantly explaining his message in parables, which are easier to memorize. Most common people today can explain some of the most popular parables, like the Good Samaritan or the Prodigal Sons. Teaching this way allows one to memorize easier. He also gave visuals and shorter lessons, examples like Mark 10.25, where it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter heaven, or like Matthew 7, where Jesus speaks in hyperbole of getting the log out of your eye before getting the speck out of someone else's. These visuals are frequent throughout the Gospels. Third, Jesus used elements of wordplay. In Matthew 23, Jesus gives a retort to the Pharisees, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. The Aramaic words were likely chosen because of the play on similarities and rhythmic delivery. Fourth and most important, scholars like Robert Stein and David Edward Ahn estimate 80% of Jesus' teachings are what you would call a parallelismus membarum, which is to give a sentence in a similar form so that the passage has a pattern and rhythm. 
There are several examples we could point to, like Luke 11, 9. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and it will be opened to you. Or Matthew 7, 17. Every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. There is an overwhelming amount of research which points this out. Thus, there is an overwhelming amount of evidence which indicates Jesus taught a controlled tradition in a way to enhance memorization. This should be pretty obvious to our culture, since many modern catchphrases we could rattle off the top of our heads come from Christ, such as go an extra mile, being a prodigal son, or a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now, skeptics may try to argue these passages were made up years later by the church. However, that is a baseless conjecture. A community creating an uncontrolled tradition would have no need to make up the facade of a controlled tradition in order to fool people hundreds of years later, or put into the text an unnecessary amount of subtle hints and off-the-cuff comments of a controlled oral tradition. The burden is on the skeptic to explain why a community would feel a need to make these things up. Because the fact remains, there is plenty of evidence which presents a preserved controlled tradition, and it is far more parsimonious than assuming an elaborate conspiracy without any direct evidence. Plus, if the words of Jesus were made up later to suit the needs of an early Christian community, why don't they reflect actual problems the early church faced? Why were the teachings of Christ not invented to suit their needs, such as later problems like if Gentiles needed to be circumcised, or what was the place for speaking in tongues, or what the resurrected body would be like? If the words of Jesus were later invented to suit the needs of early Christians, why don't we find phrases that suit every need of early Christians? It is clear the teachings of Christ were preserved, not made up to suit the needs of a later community. It is also important to point out this way of teaching will encourage memorization of important doctrines and teachings, not necessarily exact wordings. But as we've seen in part two of this series, exact wording is not what is important, but the preservation of the teachings and historical accounts. Variations in delivery can change as long as the same message is given. So when skeptics try to claim it is a huge deal we do not have the exact words Jesus spoke, they miss the point. The New Testament was meant to preserve the teachings of Christ. It is the message of the gospel that saves, not specific words. There is really no difference in message if one reports, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, or, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. As Jocelyn Small says, for oral cultures, it is not the words, but the story or the gist that counts. As long as what was really important was stated, how it was stated was not the issue. As N.T. Wright says, if we come to the ministry of Jesus as first century historians and forget our 20th century assumptions about mass media, the overwhelming probability is that most of what Jesus said, he said not twice, but 200 times with, of course, a myriad of local variations. Evidence for this is seen in Matthew and Luke's different renders of the Lord's Prayer. In Luke, Jesus states it after he is approached by his disciples while praying. And in Matthew, Jesus is reciting it in a sermon on the mountain. Christ, of course, ministered for approximately three years and would have repeated the same message to different crowds, which would have encouraged memorization among his closest disciples and followers. The essential doctrines and teachings would have been hammered into their memories. As John Wynnum said, it is exceedingly unlikely that Jesus taught about prayer only once. It is natural that he should have given the Lord's Prayer in his ask, seek, knock sayings more than once, and not always in identical words. Last, there is a clear indication specific eyewitnesses and followers of Jesus were trusted in preserving this tradition. Luke begins his gospel by telling us he received his information from eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Luke uses the Greek word huperetes which is the Greek word for the Hebrew word, Hazan. The Hazan in Judea was responsible for keeping the scrolls in the synagogue. So in Luke 1, 2, we read he received his information from the Hazans of the word. The usage of the single definite article in Luke makes it likely that these were carefully selected eyewitnesses who were trusted with keeping the oral tradition in check. Therefore, we have evidence the tradition was protected and preserved by designated authoritative eyewitnesses. If you remember in Acts chapter 1, when Judas is being replaced, the requirement for his replacement is, is that he had to be with the ministry from the beginning. And the reason is, is that the apostles had a role in overseeing this tradition. In fact, Luke refers to those who orally reported the tradition in the churches as those who are eyewitnesses and ministers of the word from the beginning. So this role of the apostles exercises a control in how this material is being passed on from church to church. 
Even if all this evidence was not available, the idea that Christian doctrines and accounts of Jesus drastically changed before they were written down is refuted by the fact that scholars have identified several early oral creeds and hymns quoted in the New Testament. These creeds and hymns demonstrate a preserved oral tradition that predate Paul's letters. If Paul was writing between the 40s and 60s, then he is quoting creeds and beliefs which existed prior to this. Most notably, the overwhelming majority of scholars date the creed preserved in 1 Corinthians 15 to within three years of Pentecost, which as Gary Habermas points out, preserves the core doctrines of Christ's death, resurrection, and divinity. Therefore, we have evidence of essential Christian doctrines in creeds written down by Paul that existed before the New Testament was written. This is by far the closest we get with any ancient document. The fact that some of our material is dated to within three years of the source is unheard of with other ancient literature. But even if these creeds did not exist, the idea the oral tradition would have been corrupted is unsupported and is nothing but paranoid suspicion. Scholars estimate the reliability of an oral tradition can last for over a century before we could expect corruption to seep in. Gilbert Garahan says it cannot go past 150 years. Marlene Kiklamani sets the limit at 200 years. This is well within the time frame of when the New Testament was written down, even if we take the latest dates for when the books were written. Therefore, when we actually look at the evidence, we see there is no reason to doubt the oral tradition of the New Testament, and there is plenty of evidence that indicates its reliability.